Thank you for joining us on this Lord's Day. We're so glad that you would seek to join with Christ Church on today, the fifth Sunday of Lent. It's hard to believe we're here, but we are here March 21st, 2021. And if you haven't joined with us, we have small groups happening during this season of Lent. We are also worshiping together for a time of reflection and prayer and contemplation on Thursdays at 630. And on Sundays, as well as this service, there's an opportunity for our children and youth, the church and community to gather and have a special opportunity for reflection on, again, the journey with Jesus to the cross and a little something creative there for children also. So please check the bulletin. You may find it at ChristChurchNYC.online. And there, once you have it, we'll begin our call to worship. You may follow along in the bold face type. Again, thank you so much for joining with us on this day. Today, the Lord makes a new covenant with the people of God. Here and now, Christ writes the law of love on our hearts. We are children of the living God. Together, we worship the Lord of love. O God of our hearts, you yearn to be so close to us that we can know you in every breath, in every hope, in every relationship. Meet us here today and teach us to recognize 
the covenant of justice, peace, and love you have written in our hearts. As Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, we pray our desires become your desires. Our work becomes your work, and our community becomes the place where you are sought and found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we lean toward Holy Week, we are confronted with the humble, sacrificial character of Jesus' life. He taught that the way up was actually the way down. Humble love defined his heart and method. This runs counter to our cultural moment, where everyone is turned into a performance artist, crafting both their virtual and actual personas into a kind of enhanced fiction. Humility and sacrifice aren't compatible attributes. Our task remains to stay true to the way of Jesus in the world, to go the distance as it were, while trusting God utterly. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of all, open our hearts and minds to find your truth in all places. Teach us your enforced rhythms of grace, that our lives might reflect your wisdom. With Christ as our guide, we live and pray. Letter to the Hebrews, Christ is known for his humility and his identification with the human condition. Christ is known by his solidarity with us. Divine love mirrors, empathizes, and connects with us. The greatest becomes the least to heal and transform us. Christ is willing to sacrifice for our salvation. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 5 through 10. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, mm-hmm.
Jesus is to see God's vision for human life and to catch a glimpse of the divine character. Like any mortal, Jesus wants to avoid the suffering on the horizon. Yet, he also recognizes that he must follow his vocation, even if it means conflict and crucifixion. Jesus has entered Jerusalem for this reason. He teaches that the way up is the way down. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Well, as you can see, I'm speaking to you from the Christ Church Sanctuary, still in the throes of renovation. All the restoration work on existing mosaics and marble has been completed, but the electricians, lighting designers, marble and wood flooring fabricators are still hard at work. Delays created by COVID and product development means we won't be opening this space for two or three more months, but eventually we'll get there, I promise. In the meantime, what we have is a work in progress. And that's why I decided to speak from here today, smack in the middle of Lent. Think of it like a visible metaphor for our traveling along with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem and the final events of his life. A different kind of work in progress. Not quite there yet, but almost. In the meantime, we've got work still to do. To stretch the analogy just a bit, we could think of Lent as a period of spiritual renovation. Stock taking, brooding on the content and character of our lives, working on broken relationships, deepening our commitment to loving God and neighbor, challenging ourselves in matters of justice and the common good. In part, we do this by zeroing in on the essence of Jesus' teaching that landed him in opposition to the power brokers of his day. Things like his relentless assertion that God did not play favorites, that some were not inherently worth more than others, that all people were created for human flourishing, that the way up was the way down, that spiritual and personal humility were key to understanding the nature of authentic love, which was at the very heart of God's creative energy in the world and our first and primary obligation. That message still runs against the grain of human preoccupations. And we heard it again in the gospel text when Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it eternally. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Now, I don't know about you, but to really let that settle into consciousness takes a lot of effort, a lot of work. We have to work at it. This sensibility of the downward path to glory was so important to Jesus' followers that some version of this is recorded in all four Gospels and twice in Luke. You remember other variations. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. And what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And so forth. So we've been tracking along with this Jesus as he proclaims this contrarian point of view for human flourishing. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, when we hear about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, quickly descending into betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. A week from Thursday, we'll recall the last meal Jesus shares with his friends that becomes the model for our communion sacrament. He will say this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Once again, interpreting his upside down value system. I hope to break bread with you that night in a family Zoom. If we have your address, you received several Holy Week tokens from me, including the Christ Church recipe for our communion bread. Maybe you'll make some as a kind of Lenten exercise. The next day, Good Friday, you're invited to go the distance to Calvary's Hill, the Hill of the Cross, upon which Jesus will be lifted. You heard him reference that today when he said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Which again, is a very topsy-turvy kind of glory 
isn't it? I'm reminding you of this schedule to help you make a choice to walk the distance with me and others who have been drawn to this man lifted high. Easter is born in the events of Holy Week and the ashes of Good Friday. Easter makes little sense without this prologue, just eggs and bunnies and springtime reverie. And I'll grant you, we are really, really ready for springtime this year. But more importantly, are we ready for a renovated life that really matters? that's synced up with the way the world has actually been fashioned despite the competing storyline that landed Jesus on a cross. Our gospel lesson began by telling us that some Greeks were in Jerusalem who wanted to see Jesus. We're not told if they ever got that opportunity while he was still alive. But the way John tells the story, they very definitely would have the chance to see him once he was lifted high, as it were. And I'm thinking that's not who they expected to see. I'm very aware that a lot of folks aren't looking for Jesus today, even though they've heard about him. For some, that's a result of their negative experience with folks who say they're Jesus devotees. Many people don't see consistency in Christians with what they profess. And true enough, we are broken pottery attempting to hold a, a precious treasure. That's part of our confession. But we still have a brilliant tradition upon which to draw, rooted in God's love and justice for the least, the last, and the lost, that is so very clearly evident in these last days of Jesus' life. Friends, it is so very important we go the distance with him now and as best we can get our lives and our priorities synced up with his to do some renovating. Many years ago now, during a time of deep personal trauma, agitation, and anxiety, a period of great renovation in my life, I had a series of dreams that I came to cherish as a profound gift and touchstone for my spiritual life. Well, for my life generally. Fear and confusion were the catalysts. But as the author of Hebrews wrote, Jesus was himself a person who was subject to weakness. He was tempted in every way, just as we are. He prayed his prayers to God with loud cries and tears. This Jesus was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows who knew from experience the meaning of grief. It was this very, very human Jesus that I initially found so compelling and attractive and, and ultimately converting. Well, the dreams came to me as a series over several nights in a row. Never before or since has that happened to me. They linked sequentially as a journey I was taking from my home to another part of the country. Eventually, I began to take walks further and further away from civilization. Each night brought me deeper into a baked and waterless wilderness. I had no provision, just the sensibility that I was on a lonely journey. One night, I stumbled into a campfire and in my dream sensed, shockingly, this belonged to Jesus and his companions although I saw no one. The following night began where I had left off, by the campfire. But this time I was aware that Jesus was very much present, although not physically. I couldn't see him, but he was everywhere, as it were. And eventually I heard him clearly tell me that I could not stay there with him, but had to go still further into the wilderness. The last night of the sequence, I found myself in a vast desert. Think of an image of the Sahara, without visible boundary. Endless dunes broiled in a merciless heat. Now, thoroughly dehydrated, I was aware 
that I would likely die. I couldn't imagine what this journey was about until at my most desperate moment, splayed out on the sand, the earth began to shake and rumble, and a great city erupted from the dunes all around and under me, bit by bit, lifting me up. First, the pinnacles of towers and eventually great and beautiful buildings rose up. And then in a glorious eruption right in the center, a flowing fountain burst forth. I sat bolt upright in bed, awake, gasping in astonishment, tears streaming down my face. The memory of that awakening has stayed with me all these decades later. <laughs> Make of it what you will, or nothing at all. Just a bad case of gastrointestinal distress, perhaps. But I will tell you that from that time forward, I began making sense of the meaning and linkage of going the distance and trusting God. These became bedrock constructs for me and remain so to this day. A great, great renovation of my life. Despite many other layers of learning and competencies I've accumulated over the years, I can't tell you how many times I've returned to these essential constructs as the ground under my feet or the air I breathe, going the distance and trusting God utterly and I rehearse them every year about this time, consciously and purposefully, because I recognize how far afield I can stray, how enamored of my own cleverness I can become, and arrogant in my opinions and judgments. Like Jesus, I try to return to my weakness and vulnerability as I journey onward, grateful that God has my back and my front and sides as well. In this way, I recognize that my humanity was made for glory too, like Jesus, who invited his friends to pattern their journey on his. How countercultural does that sound? <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. Or, or maybe it's exactly for the faint of heart. Maybe it's only the faint of heart who can acknowledge their need and walk the lonely journey into true authenticity. The Apostle Paul had it exactly right when he wrote, When I am weak, then I am strong. Which is to say that taking the same path Jesus blazed all the way into a kind of death, stripped of our sense of power and place and completely reliant on God, we discover finally our true strength. Now, I know this can sound like so much gibberish until a moment comes when we're up against the wall of our human limitations, when we've run out of answers and we wind up flailing around and acting out, lost in the desert, as it were, without provision, that we find ourselves finally available to the source of life itself. And in the humility of being last of all, we find that God would nevertheless place us at the head of the line. And man, that would be something to celebrate for certain. We call it Easter.
At the beginning of this year, my husband and I sat down to go over our finances and to try to anticipate some of the expenses we would have. And he asked me, what if we just gave to the church once everything that we would otherwise give over 12 months so I don't have to account for it all the time? And I had this very strong reaction, which was, no, I give every month. That's what I've always done. That's what I do. And he pointed out that that is a terrible reason to continue doing something, which was fair, but it made me realize why it's important to me to give every month. And a big part of that is it's one of the only ways that I can actively participate in our community right now. And while well, I can't sit with you and sing with you and pray with you and wave to you on Sunday mornings, I can still do this every week on a regular basis. And just knowing that I am doing something, even if it doesn't feel like very much, is really powerful tether to our wonderful community. So I invite you now to join me and my family and go to ChristChurchNYC.online slash donate. There are a number of ways you can give. You can set up a recurring payment or give a one-time gift, but everything helps and is appreciated. Holy God, you are more than we can know or name. Yet we call on you again and again, for you alone are God. We cannot live apart from you, for you have called us into your life. Your steadfast love surrounds us all our days. Wherever we may be, you call to us. And though often hard of hearing, we are grateful for your persistent grace that will not let us go. Today we gather in gratitude for all the good gifts you've given us, for the beauty of creation, for the lives of those who bless us beyond their knowing, for this community of faith, for opportunities to serve you by serving others, and for the gift of life granted yet again today. God. In your wisdom, receive our prayer. We gather in humility and hopeful in need. For those we know who are suffering due to illness in mind, body, and spirit, whom we now name in our hearts. For those in the midst of a difficult decision, For those grieving a loss, an ending, or a dream deferred. For all who intentionally seek to grow into the people you've intended, but find the journey hard. We pray for healing and strength in every broken place of our lives. God in your wisdom, receive our prayer. We gather in concern for this world in turmoil, for those whose lives have been devastated by pandemic, for those who are hungry, thirsty, or experiencing any deprivation, for our political and civil leaders, that they may listen to the better injuries of our human nature, for the sake of the common good, for the many victims of injustice and for the growing of our collective will to correct systems of injustice and for all of us that you root out of our hearts the seeds of bigotry and narrow-mindedness. Stir us from apathy, increase in us empathy that we may love as you love. God, in your wisdom, receive our prayer. Holy God, stir within us a deep passion to hold ever before us whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, 
whatever is excellent and anything worthy of praise. Strengthen us to go the distance while trusting your grace utterly. God, in your wisdom, receive our prayer. And now, friends, we gladly join together in the prayer that Jesus gave us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now, friends, know that the ever-present mystery we name God is in your past forgiving you, in your present loving you, and in your future meeting you. And may the blessing of the source of life, love, and hope, the word of life, compassion, and wisdom, and the breath of life, grace, and truth, surround, sustain, and surprise you this day and all your days, amen. Stephen Bauman here in the Christ Church Sanctuary on the corner of Park Avenue and 60th Street, still undergoing renovation, as you can see. It's been a very long haul. Our last service in this space was Christmas 2019. Many ask how things are going, so I thought I'd show you around a bit, providing a sense of where we are in the process. The restoration of the mosaics and marble was finished months ago, in, including the ceiling and all of the walls. Once all the scaffolding was taken out, we were able to begin reshaping the chancel area between the pulpit and the lectern, as well as replacing and reforming a good chunk of the floor. By the way, we were able to source some of the floor marble from the very same originating quarries that were used 90 years ago. Our new sanctuary lan lanterns that aren't here yet, they match the original intended design that never were made. They're still being fabricated. They stand six feet tall. In other words, they're as tall as I am, four feet wide, weighing nearly 600 pounds each. Many other lighting enhancements are in process, all LED. You can see little samples of them scattered about this space in the photography. This place will be dazzling 
and details of the art and architecture truly made visible for the very first time. Re-electrifying this place has been one of the biggest jobs of all, begun in January 2020 and still not yet finished. It required pulling wire and conduit all over the place, throughout the space, on multiple floors. Now, as you know, while we wanted to bring our space into the 21st century, we also wanted to do this respectfully and sparingly so as not to diminish the beauty of this Ralph Adams Cram masterpiece. But now let's walk around for a bit to get a closer look. You'll see some of the floor marble that's being formed, some of the green marble in that corner there. And coming up on the in the uh, chancel area, I see our very own Dr. Pilkington. You've Steve. forgotten my name. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what are you thinking about all of this? Tell uh, us. First of all, hi, Christchurch family. Um, I've lived this in a unique way in that I've been at the church virtually every day since the lockdown. Um, kind of making the church my own gargantuan studio. Um, <laughs> well, it's always been that. <laughs> well, good point. Um, so I've watched the demolition, I've watched the cleaning, and uh, watched the new marble go in, and uh, I'm so excited about um, just the sheer beauty of what's uh, happening here. Even though now there's plastic and uh, all the construction equipment here. But you'll notice um, that up here um, is where some of our thousands of organ pipes are housed. And you may remember some old white, uh, they were like a drapery fabric that was very thin and incredibly do dirty. They were actually white anymore because of all the dust, they were gray. Um, but they are gone and they're gone permanently. And notice they've constructed some new balustrades that match the uh, uh, railing balustrade in the chapel um, perfectly and beautifully. And so the entire organ um, will be, not the entire organ, but the facade of the organ will be visible. And I'm super excited to hear the sound. Um, I have a feeling it won't be louder um, not possible, um, <laughs> but definitely will be clearer. And maybe you can hear from Steve's voice and my voice, there's a resonance in the room, which is also very exciting in terms of the music making. And I think the last thing I'd say is just uh, this uh, opening up of the chancel area. I hope you can see that. Um, Whereas before, it kind of felt like the building did this um, with the fencing, the brass railing, and our choir climbing in and out, and kids in and out, and uh, lay persons reading in and out. And now it's just like a big, vast uh, opening of the arms. And uh, I'm excited to inhabit the space and make uh, worship even more exciting than it's been in the past. Um, and I'm impatient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we're all impatient. You can see some of the new added light uh, fixtures, say, in the, these openings in the chapel from a distance. And they are up and down as well. And even the way some of these mosaics are lit now, these are tests on these fabulous um, LED throws that are now way back but they have a they have a very effective throw and that just gives you a little taste of how this place will be lit and of course it will be ready um, with uh, the technology wi-fi with uh, cameras and uh, enhanced sound all of that it will be well in place as well very exciting very exciting thing and I want to point out that this is our new seating, a chair. We've done away with the pews. And what the beauty is of having chairs 
is that uh, we'll be able to reassemble this space in any variety of configurations, or they could be lined up just like pews. But it gives us great flexibility. And another thing I want to tell you about them is you are invited to purchase them. For a cool $500, you can have your very own chair as a memorial, as your opportunity to participate in this restoration of Christ Church 2.0. Very exciting opportunity. You'll be hearing more about this opportunity, but start thinking, how many chairs am I going to want? And uh, what's the nature of the dedication for that chair? Hang on to those thoughts. So now, when will all this be finished? Well, due to COVID and material delays, probably not until the latter part of May. Just two and a half more months, fingers crossed. We are so very fortunate to have this amazing space coming online, just as our season of pandemic will be drawing to a close. By the way, in case you missed it, in our season of giving campaign last December, we actually made our goal of an additional $200,000 to be given away the first part of this year to needful recipients due to COVID. Good for you, congratulations. But if you haven't yet made your pledge of support for the current year, I invite you to go right now to ChristChurchNYC.online backslash donate. We need you more than ever to help launch the post-pandemic church. Let's make that happen in a big way. I remain so grateful for our community, for you, and so glad we get to share this part of life's journey together. I thank God for that daily. Stay tuned.